Sports have been both a fun thing to play and watch. It generates millions of dollars every year and can drive an entire stadium to the point of rioting. I'm, I'm not joking either. Look at some of the Canadian riots out there. Sports are a pretty big deal in our world, and we have to realize that it's also something that can require a ton of evolution over time. Now, I'm pretty sure someone just didn't come up with the idea of basketball when they were cavemen beating each other's heads in. But we're going to explore the idea of even how that came to be. As humans, we've had to create a base type of sport to even get to where we are today. For example, racing. It's adapted into soccer and football now. What many people don't seem to realize is how sports really did come to be what it is nowadays. To understand how sports have moved forward, right up to this fascinating point in time, I decided to start with our ancestors. My reasoning behind this is that I picture sports much like a house. What comes first is the foundation, and it's really been developed and added to over time. According to Britannica, it's possible that the first type of sport that we as humans participated in was contests, as an athletic contests, you know, stuff like running, for example, lifting heavy objects. However, just as impressing the local gal was fairly important to a lot of people at the time, so was getting to eat some meat. This means that hunting was important, and we know this because of the prehistoric art during that period of time. Now, it's not directly known if people during that time period did in fact train to hunt, as in increased endurance, strength, patience, etc. There's also the reality that war, something that is often assumed our ancestors did quite often, is the true creator of sports, as it could also require much of the same training that hunting would. You see, the interesting part of Britannica mentioning, you know, possible contests, is that it measures someone's physical ability and even allowed an observer to learn more about the person, especially if they were potential allies. Not many people wanted a weak person to be the one they're fighting against, so, it's best to find someone who's effective in all aspects of the athletic competition. According to Michael P. Lombardo, who works with the Department of Biology at Grand Valley State University, quote, Sports originally provided males with important but relatively low-cost opportunities to, one, develop the physical abilities, uh, agility, endurance, eye-hand coordination, speed, strength, and behaviors, you know, context-appropriate aggressiveness, and so on and so forth, and two, evaluate the physical abilities and behavioral tendencies of potential allies and rivals so as to adaptively interact with them during future encounters, end quote. Now that you know some of the reasons why we actually practiced and played some early form of sport, you have to learn what some of the competitions actually entailed. Yes, I already know that running and lifting heavy stuff is pretty important, but what about the different aspects like spear throwing and other cool crap that we used to do before we got our modern day sports like football and soccer? According to Britannica, ancient Egypt, a place that was a hotbed for many things, especially sports, such as wrestling, which uh, according to the Atlantic first showed up around 15,000 BC. Ball games supposedly popped up in Egypt around 3200 BC, stick fights, and apparently even jumping. All these things apparently appeared uh, in that uh, majestic time in the world. I'd also like to mention that these sports are a clear build off of classic competitions performed before their time. Now, one possible reason behind this would be that people are always trying to develop and make things better. If we take a look at the Greeks, which historically they've given us a few notable things, like democracy and a form of the Olympic Games in 1776 BC, this is a time period in which sports and religion really got slapped together. It's clear that at the time people attempted to honor the god of or goddess in the form of athletic contests. However, they were also honored in several different aspects as well. One example of this would be the sky god Zeus, whose priests conducted contests in honor of him. Physical contests, might I remind you. Another example is the sacred games held at Delphi and in honor of Apollo. Let's jump forward a little bit because uh, I'd like to take a special time to talk about the Middle Ages. Uh, those, those are the days, huh? Eh? When, when you died at 50. It's a unique time in which many people openly explored many different things. The period in time really did have some sports that are 
still very active today. If you speak to Sir John Fitzrofe, who wrote a document called War Archery and Social Statue, you'll notice a few things about archery during this time period. Some of them are that archery not only uh, was sometimes used in hunting as it is today, but was obviously used for war during this period. It's well known that the nobility of the ancient times enjoyed their fair share of archery. As many things tend to note, children were in the mix of this, but please note they were not the ones being shot by archers. Children often uh, practiced archery as a sport, especially, you know, if they were to children of nobles. The interesting part of archery is that it was used in both hunting and war. This means that someone who didn't have much experience shooting someone with a bow probably did you know, have a little experience shooting an animal with it. There was also a little known sport called folk football. It was run by the peasants. Well, come on guys, they had to play something. Can't just farm all day. That game in particular pitted married men against bachelors, but also, uh, in some cases, one village against another. The game was even so violent that it was condemned by Sir Thomas Eliot since it could possibly cause more damage than benefit to those playing it. Some other sports included the ever popular and long lasting wrestling and as the usual running as you've probably come to notice by now is quite popular. There was also a little known thing called jousting. We've seen it all go down. Even the 90s show Daria had a little bit of a mention to it. So, I mean, it's it's come to be a reference for, for anyone that watches pretty much anything medieval at this point in time. You gotta know what jousting is, right? If you're wondering, the rules were also quite simple. You can't hit the horse or just let it slow down too much. The players would also need to strike the guard on the opposing side's shoulder. Now, to know a bit more on the rules of jousting, you should probably watch the video uh, that the History Channel posted. It's pretty interesting, you'll learn a lot. Given you do need to realize that women's sports really started to gain some level of popularity in the present era since women's rights have improved greatly over the past few centuries. However, despite that, women in the Middle Ages supposedly engaged in foot races which had been common since 15,000 BC. So the Middle Ages is cool and all, but what about the creation of many sports that we know and love today? Modern sports have had a terrific transformation from what they were in the past. They've without a doubt been something that has become both safer and a great way to pull on some quick cash. I'm not joking, like go look at Stephen Curry's salary. All right, am I right there? Yeah, I know you're Googling it right now. Now, I'd like to, to mention basketball. It was invented in 1891 because of some dude by the name of James Nysmith. Legend has it that he was an educator and was tasked with creating a new indoor sports activity. It's been said that the original game had 13 rules and a peach basket hung 10 feet above the floor. Basketball obviously took off like wildfire and has become something that many people enjoy to watch. But that wasn't the only thing that was invented in the 19th century. There's a little thing that we now call soccer, or football for some of you. Let the debate rage on. According to John Doyle, an author who wrote a book called The World is a Ball, this little piece of work came into existence in England as an organized sport. It's been said that this particular sport was spread around the world as England began to trade with other countries and essentially create an empire. Another reason why this sport has survived this long is that it's simple and cheap. All you need to know are the rules, which apparently haven't changed all that much since it came into existence. And then the next thing you need is a round ball that you can kick with your feet. Soccer, basketball, they're, they're all fun, yeah? But they're also something our mothers didn't enjoy very much since you can get injured. However, the world of sports is changing. The above mentioned sports have aged quite well when they're compared to their 2018 relative. The sports I just spoke about also still exist and are widely popular, but some new players have emerged. Some that are more interesting than others, or well, can attract a certain type of person that likes to get, you know, a little punishment when they make a mistake. Now, one of these games where you can get that type of feeling, or I should say adrenaline rush, is Airsoft. Airsoft is one of those new players. It's a sport where people have BB guns and wear military gear. 
and they can participate in many different things. With that, you know, capture the flag games, team deathmatch, milsim, which is military simulation. It's actually quite cool. According to the Japan Times, Japan itself is seen as the originating country of the sport in the 1970s. One possible reason for this was because of Japan's supposedly strict gun laws. The sport itself has also been used as a simulation of military tactics on both large scale and small scale matches. Now this is known as Milsim. It's also gained popularity on the internet, with content creators like Desert Fox Airsoft regularly putting out videos on the new weapons and playstyles that are available. The rules of Airsoft are rather simple, but safety is one of the most important ones. I mean, it's pretty important. People will yell at you if you don't wear your mask or your goggle. In fact, some fields actually require a full face mask. Then there are the rules that more people are willing to break. The one that determines if you're out or not. Generally, feeling a slight pinch will be a sufficient notice that you've been hit by a BB and you gotta raise your hand and yell, hit. Then you go walk back to your respawn. Paintball, much like airsoft, is a modern sport, but one that strikes far more fear in people's hearts. It began in the 60s to the 70s when the Nelson Paint Company developed a gelatin-shelled spear that could be loaded up with oil-based paint. According to ThoughtCo, the US Forestry Service asked the company to come up with a device that could mark trees from a significant distance away. Now, Nelson and a company known as Daisy, they were an air gun manufacturer at the time, those two came up with a little something called the splotch maker. This was later rebranded as the Nelspot 007. I don't know, it, it sounds pretty cool to say that I got hit by a splotch maker, but that's just me. Now this caught the eyes of two people. Their names were Hayes Noel and Charles Gaines. These two guys had been debating for years on who had the better survival skills, but it really came down to a duel, but not with a gun. Well, technically a gun. It, it was the Nelspot 007. From that point on, the two invited some friends and they played a capture the flag game. Eventually, this led to the creation of an amazing sport that allows anyone to go on the field and shoot other people with small uh, pellets for fun. Now, if you're wondering what the rules of paintball are, it's, you know, very similar to airsoft. Mask, if you're, if you get hit, you gotta call it. It's a lot more painful, you get bruised. It's also a lot harder to cheat. Well, we can't avoid the future, can we? So lie down on the couch and let's talk. But I need to tell you one thing before we begin. I'd like to clearly note to you that traditional sports will likely still exist, but there'll just be more competition to keep an audience. Where will the future of sports lead us? What will it look like? These are all valid questions. Now the future is already gaining popularity every day. It's known as eSports and really gets the blood flowing for the gaming community, I tell ya, oh yeah. This generation basically grew up with video games. I'm not talking about just arcades, no, I'm talking about the hardcore stuff. Counter-Strike, Battlefield, Call of Duty, Rainbow Six Siege, League of Legends, Dota 2, and a ton more. The developers of the game, you know, and publishers and all that, they helped find a way for the top players in those gaming communities to get together and fight in a virtual land. Esports has found a ton of money from people being able to stream their gaming sessions to simply getting high paying sponsors to support your content. This leads to bigger events with bigger sponsors and ultimately bigger rewards. You get me? According to Esports earnings, the top performer was Dota 2 and the winning team seems to have got a fat check of $25 million. This kind of sport is debated though. Obviously not everyone feels that sitting in a chair and playing against each other is a real sport. According to Kurt Melcher, who explained this on the Curiosity podcast, quote, you need to know where you are in the map and what part of the game it is and where are your opponents and where are your teammates and what are the objectives and should I be farming? Should I be trying to get this objective? End quote. 